Hello everyone, this is Bob Souza speaking from historic Main Street in Somerset Village. We're here again at SATV Channel 9 to bring you highlights of Major League Baseball from 1934 to 1957. Today we have the original 8mm and 16mm films in living and breathing color, the first time Baseball was ever filmed in color. Previously, everything was black and white, uh, movie tone highlights. But now, films taken by the players, family members of players, and fans of the game of baseball were sent to PBS. PBS put the documents on the table, and for viewing purposes, the first ever World Series in color 1938, the New York Yankees and the Chicago Cubs marched into Wrigley Field live and in color. So we here at Channel 9 very fortunate to have the original films in color of Major League Baseball when it was a game. Also we'll get a look at some of the great ballparks of the 1920s, 30s, and 40s. We have in Boston Braves Field in New York, the Polo Grounds and Ebbets Field for the Dodgers. In Philadelphia, we have Scheib Park, which was home to the Phillies, and of course, in the American League, to the Philadelphia Athletics. The Western cities, Crosley Field in Cincinnati, Forbes Field in Pittsburgh, Wrigley Field in Chicago, and Sportsman's Park in St. Louis, home for both the St. Louis Cardinals of the National League and the St. Louis Browns of the American League. The two oldest parks, Fenway Park for the Boston Red Sox in the American League, 1912, and Wrigley Field for the Cubs, before, as we mentioned before, 1916. And the ballpark that didn't even appear, which is in third place chronologically in today's world, 1962 Dodger Stadium. So you can tell the original ballparks are no longer around other than Fenway and Wrigley Field. Yankee Stadium in 1923, and uh, let's see, we have Griffith Stadium in Washington, a Municipal Stadium in Cleveland, Briggs Stadium in Detroit, Comiskey Park in Chicago, and the aforementioned Sportsman Park in St. Louis. So we ask that the audience enjoy this film today and definitely we had individuals who had to augment their salary. Ball players had to get winter jobs because the salaries were very minuscule. The owners were not billionaires or millionaires in this film today. Many of them were former major league players who bought parts of teams and had to struggle themselves in order to meet payroll twice a month. An excellent narrator, Peter Kessler, features today's broadcast along with thrilling voiceovers from James Earl Jones, Roy Scheider, and Jason Robards.
Baseball connects American males with each other, not only through bleacher friendships and neighbor loyalties, but most importantly through generations. You learn your first lesson of the rainbow arc all living makes, but that baseball exaggerates. For when you're in the sixth grade, the rook has fuzz on his face and throws to the wrong base. Before you leave junior high, he is a season regular, the body filled out, his jowl ripples with tobacco. When you graduate from high school, he is a grizzled veteran, even if you are not certain what grizzled means. In a few years, the green shoot becomes the withered stalk, and you learn the hill all beings travel by. There was a time in baseball when there were only eight teams in each major league. They played an orderly, balanced schedule, visiting each city four times. A trip out west meant St. Louis or Chicago. There was a comfortable rhythm to the season. When they referred to the Giants, it was the New York Giants. The Dodgers were a Brooklyn institution, seemingly forever. There was an American League team in St. Louis and a National League one in Boston. That time is gone now. But it's been said one reason baseball is so gripping to the American imagination is that certain eras inevitably evoke certain images. Perhaps none more so than the years from the end of the Depression through World War II and into the 1950s. It was a time when baseball was the focal point of sports in our society. A time when baseball was still just a game, a familiar game, which in a changing world, somehow reassured us with its return every year on the warm winds of spring. Poet, Donald Hall. My heart starts to sing like a bird. I feel my uh, wings stretch out and warm air coming. Spring is the hope of the earth, and uh, baseball is the same hope, the beginning of it. Uh, it's wonderful, it's a ritual, it's, it's practically a magic, like an old mystery religion. Spring always has special meaning for the baseball romantic, but for the baseball player of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s, Spring was anything but an idyllic time of year. In the months before the coming season, a player had to prove to management that he hadn't slowed a step over the winter in a game that didn't pamper its players. St. Louis Cardinal, Enos Slaughter. They gave me my cap, my belt, top and bottom and red socks. You bought your own sweat socks, you bought your own jockey straps, you bought your own sweatshirt, and you had to see that they got laundry. You even down had to pay for your own sandwich between double headers. Every year, I went to spring training. They had some young outfield hit 340, 350. They were going to take my job. Well, you know, they wanted to get to the big leagues also. Somebody's going to take my job. I'm still hitting 300, driving in close to 100 runs every year, and I knew I had to bear down to hold my job. And I went to spring training every year thinking that I had to make my job. Pitcher, Eldon Auker. We had no assurance of anything. They could release us anytime they wanted to, and we didn't have much to say about it. We just signed a a four-page contract, and everybody signed it. Didn't make a difference who you were, but then you signed it. And they could trade you, they could do anything to you until you were in the major leagues 10 years. You were just like a, an automobile. They could get rid of you anytime they want and get a new one. Wonderful day, play ball, 
let's get the game underway. Hey, you with the hot dogs, two over here. Where's that peanut vendor and the guy with all the beer? Strike one. Your favorite players at bat. Strike two. You squirm and fuss with your hat. And then you see him tag one right on the nose. And then you watch it going, going, Whoa, on. There, there it goes. goes. What are we waiting for? Let's get the game underway. What are we waiting for? It's a wonderful day. Let's start the game underway. Accuracy and speed, the practiced eye and hefty arm. The mind to take in and readjust to the unexpected. The possession of more than one talent and the willingness to work in harness without special orders. These are the American virtues that shine in baseball. It is graphic and choreographic. Baseball is a kind of collective chess with arms and legs in full play under sunlight. When the major leagues were made up of just 16 teams, the game was in many ways heartless and mean. Spots on a roster had to be earned every year, and there was hardly a player to be found who didn't take his job seriously. Chicago Cub, Billy Herman. The only thing we had in our minds was to win. Any way we could, we play to win. And uh, if that wasn't good enough, why well, you go back home, get a lunch pail, go to work. Now, if they didn't play hard, you didn't have, he, he wouldn't have a friend on the club, and he wouldn't be there long. If you were on first base and, and the batter hit a ground ball, you had to take that runner out. If you didn't take that runner out ball, you'd come on the bench, and you'd almost have to fight some of your teammates. The biggest mistake I ever made in, in the major leagues was my first time at bat. I got a base hit. The next time up, I got hit right in the head. In a slaughter. If you can't get brushed back or get knocked back once in a while, you got no business in this game. Every time the Cardinal and Dodgers played, two or three guys didn't get knocked down, so not a Cardinal and Dodger game. They knocked me down. I knew every pitch in the leg that knocked me down and hit one me in the middle of the back. I didn't forget them. If they ever covered first, I'd try to cut the legs off. It didn't bother me at all. Slaughter no doubt inherited some of his swagger from his cardinal predecessors, the original Gas House Gang, a collection of fast-talking, free-spirited players like Leo DeRocher, who never ducked a fight and always played hard. In the 30s, the Gas House Gang Cardinals were not only baseball's best team, but also the most colorful. Witness Pepper Martin in 1937, showing off his legendary juggling act. Entertaining came naturally to the Gas House Gang. Keeping clean, however, was another matter. New York Yankee, Tommy Henrik. Oh, I saw Frankie Frisch in New Orleans in 36 when they were the real Gas House Gang with Pepper Martin. And they came around there, most of them needed a shave. And every one of them had a dirty uniform on. I said, what a bunch of bums. Now, these are really the gas house gang. Immaculate uniforms meant little to men with rowdy reputations. Winning, however, meant everything. Never was the Cardinals' raucous, hell-bent style of play more evident than in their 1934 World Series appearance against the Detroit Tigers. Cardinal infielder, Burgess Whitehead. Doc Weaver was our trainer when I was a member of the St. Louis Cardinals. He uh, uh, brought a camera into the dugout during the 34 World Series and made a lot of pictures of, of different plays and of the different players. Detroit was such a wild baseball city then. We had to have uh, security guards, you might call them, uh, 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 to stand in, in, uh, uh, at the door of the Book Cadillac Hotel in Detroit so we could get in. The people were just crowded around the hotel. 
The Gas House Gang was the greatest baseball club I ever saw. They thought they could beat any ball club, and, and they just about could, too. Of course, we had some characters on that club, uh, like Pepper Martin, one of the hustlingest ball players I ever saw. And Dizzy Dean and uh, Leo Durocha, one of the greatest uh, shortstops I ever played alongside. When they got on that ball field, they played baseball. I mean, they played it to the hilt, too. And when they slid, they slid hard, and uh, uh, there was no good fellowship between them and the opposition. They were just good, tough ball players. That was a tough series. Uh, it was a hard-fought series, and uh, the players hustled so hard. Uh, it was because of the depression, and they wanted that winner's share. The series went seven games, and the deciding game, the seventh game, uh, did the Dean beat Eldon Alka, 11 to nothing. It enabled me to help my family. My father had kind of tough luck during the Depression, and uh, that's when we got uh, $6,800. But I don't know, that 6800 was mighty good. I suppose there must be some item that an American boy might treasure more fiercely than a Louisville slugger with his own signature on it. But I can't think of one. For all of us who grew up on sandlots and playgrounds, gripping Louisville sluggers bearing the autographs of major league stars, the thought of owning one with our name on the barrel is almost too much to comprehend. All baseball players enter the field of play with the same tools, a bat, a ball, and a glove. The bat helps keep the batter alive, but when the ball is hit, it's the glove that becomes most important. That might explain why players become so attached to the single piece of equipment they can spend an entire career with. Infielder, Bill Werber. The glove that I used was a little bit larger than my hand. I had my gloves all made out of the belly of the cow because it was soft. It didn't need a lot of breaking in, but they, they, were, they weren't a large glove. I never dropped any balls, but you could maneuver them. Perhaps the most interesting fact about gloves in the 30s and 40s was what happened to them between innings. Rather than take their gloves into the dugout after the third out was made, the fielders of the day simply left their gloves on the field and retrieved them on their way out to their positions. It was a practice that held true until the mid-50s. Author, Robert Creamer. You see a play where a shortstop would end the inning by making a catch of a line drive. You know, he'd, he'd catch the ball, flip the ball to an umpire, and throw the glove up in the air like that. It would sort of spin, and it would land on the field out there. And it was such a pretty thing to see, with guys trotting out the field and bending down and picking up their glove and, and taking it again. It's uh, antique. Antique, too, were the uniforms, perhaps the most identifiable feature of baseball's golden age. Loose fitting and made of heavy wool, a father might have been proud to show off the colorful uniforms of the day, but they weren't exactly designed with comfort in mind. Brooklyn Dodger, Duke Snyder. I mean, you go into St. Louis, Cincinnati in the summertime, and it's a hot, humid day, and you get those wool uniforms, you start perspiring and get those things wet, and they pick up some weight. They, you know, all of a sudden, you're carrying five, six, seven, eight pounds extra along with you. 
as baggy as they were, they weren't all that comfortable, but we didn't know any better. So we were comfortable. Without a doubt, baseball's most recognizable uniform has always belonged to the New York Yankees. Unending years of sartorial splendor in pinstripes. Other teams, however, frequently change their look. For instance, in spring training before the 1942 season, the New York Giants gathered around their player manager, Mel Ott, wearing uniforms during the war that were a patriotic red, white, and blue. The pre-World War II Pittsburgh Pirates wore black and red, while during the same era, the Philadelphia Phillies uniforms were predominantly blue. Whether they have remained the same over the years or changed a great deal, uniforms, like the players who wear them, give us the means to savor the game's past. Author, Donald Honig. A, a, a team can bring back an era, a player can just re recreate the sense of a year. The baseball freezes these moments and, and, and holds them until you want to think about them. And then they're released again in all their youthful energy and, uh, and vitality a as they were. A, a ball player's never age in memory, they're always young. Teams, however, do disappear, or more accurately, change locations or names. And the nostalgia that their uniforms evoke is part of what we have left to remember them by. For a few hours, for a summer, we think we know them. These young men in three colored caps playing the game of boyhood to brief in our eyes. Do they play for us, or are they performing the ancient demands of their decorated bodies? They wear their names on their backs, but they wear costumes designed a century past of gentlemen meeting of a Sunday on the grass. For a period of four seasons, from 1942 through 1945, World War II affected baseball in pretty much the same manner it affected everyday life. The game went on, but it couldn't possibly be the same not with constant reminders at ballparks around America that we were indeed at war. There were even those who considered suspending baseball, but, as Eldon Auker remembers, the most influential and important American was not among them. President Roosevelt wanted professional baseball to continue, and the reason for it was to keep up the morale of the people during the war. He said his baseball was such a, a, an American pastime, he said, for us to quit baseball wouldn't be right. To impress upon all owners and all players that they should continue and not quit just because the war, war started. And I think that uh, that was an expression of how the people felt in those days about baseball. New York Yankee Tommy Henrick. A lot of the best ball players went into the service. So it's a doggone cinch. Each team, the, the brand of ball they're playing is going to be a little inferior to what they had before the Stars left. In fact, with most of baseball's best players at war, the previously inept St. Louis Browns won their first and only American League pennant in 1944. Attendance during the war years suffered too. And in an effort to encourage more fans to attend games, team owners came up with several outlandish contests involving players, the winners receiving no more than a $100 war bond.
After the war, the promotions continued, some with celebrities from outside baseball like Jesse Owens, who raced and barely beat George Case of the Cleveland Indians in 1946. In the early 50s, stars like Abbott and Costello would make occasional appearances at ballparks. Here, they're at a Boston Braves game, answering the question of, who's on first? In the 30s and 40s, it was not unusual to see players or coaches participate in comedy sketches for the newsreels. In this case, the foil is Benny Bengal of the Washington Senators. Comedy and baseball have had a long and entertaining partnership. Former pitcher Al Schacht, who was known as the Clown Prince of Baseball, appeared at 25 World Series, including the 1940 Series at Tiger Stadium. When Schacht retired in the early 50s, it was Max Patkin who inherited the title of Clown Prince. Amazingly, Patkin performed not only before the game, but during it as a legitimate first base coach. Max Patkin. When I do my routine, I try to do it between pitches. I usually have between 10 and 15 seconds. Do be surprised what 10 seconds means to a Max Patkin on the coaching line. So it gives me a chance to go through that goofy thing of motion with my neck, my arms, my legs, just to make out I'm giving a sign to the batter. That would give me just enough time. All I needed was 8 to 10 seconds. Bing, 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 bump, boom, ba, that. And you know, <laughs> and I, that when I looked at those days, I'm telling you, I was the dumbest looking thing you ever saw in that coaching line. Smart, don't be a chump. For we know without a doubt, man, that ump will put you out. Before the 1950s, teams traveled to and from games by train bringing them together, but with a lifestyle that was far from glamorous. Enos Slaughter. We'd play a doublehead in St. Louis. I'd lose 16 pound doubleheader. We'd rush to the railroad station, jump the train. Time we got over into Indiana, you know, through Illinois, the air condition go off. Monday morning, we'd get up, you know, and they'd have a, Ricky would have an exhibition someplace out in Ohio, uh, Indiana. They'd pull our Pullman cars off to the side. We'd get out and play an exhibition game. Since then, we'd get back on the train. And next morning, you wake up going around Horseshoe Curve in Altoona, Pennsylvania, and pull into Philadelphia and play that night. St. Louis Cardinal, Whitey Kurowski. Many times, we'd have those 18, 24-hour trips on a train. Well, we'd before we'd hit the sack, why? We'd get back in a in a club car or someplace in the in the men's room, and it, all of us we'd be talking about the ball game. Us, we were just one big happy family. Doubtless, there are better places to spend summer days, summer nights, than in ballparks. Doubtless. Nevertheless. Decades after a person has stopped collecting bubblegum cards, he can still discover himself collecting ballparks. And not just the stadiums, but their surrounding neighborhoods, their smells, their special seasons and moods. Quaint, sure. Beautiful, not really. However, when the sun is bright and the air crisp and your seat seems closer to the diamond than the on-deck hitter, all is forgiven. In the days before television, the only way a person could see a baseball game was to come to the stadium. 
there was perhaps no greater feeling than spending an afternoon at the ballpark. Poet Donald Hall. Walking through the crowds uh, into that uh, great small old stadium, and there they were in the flesh. I can see them now in their baggy old pants. Uh, the uh, players uh, whom I had heard about, whom, of whom I'd seen photographs, uh, but there they were really walking around, uh, live people and the absolute uh, enchantment and enthrallment of the uh, tension of starting the game, play ball. Author, Donald Honig. And when you went out to, to the ball game, it was someplace special. And the, the, these guys was, was something special to you, and you really focused on them. Because you, weren't, you didn't see them anywhere else. Uh, well, all the rest of the time and all winter, you talked about them and argued about them with your friends. Uh, and then that special occasion when you went out, your father took your older brother or you were a young teenager and, and you went out yourself and you're still very impressionable. And you were able to watch these guys up close. It made quite an impact. The PA system, so the voice of God, you know, is coming down. Who the hell ever announced lineups? You know, we all played on, on the sand lots. And suddenly this voice comes, you know, reading the lineup, you know, it's coming down from the heavens. This, this was uh, an incredible thing, you know, the first time. It was 1941, I was just 10 years old, and it was a Dodger Cardinal game, and we, we came up the, the ramp heading for the for the cheap seats, and for a moment I had a glimpse of the field, and standing up and, and uh, outside the dugout and looking right at me was Johnny Mize, big John Mize of the St. Louis Cardinals. And it just struck me, I said to my brothers, Johnny Mize. Yeah, my brother got all excited. It hit you all at once. Like nearly all of the pre-expansion ballparks, Boston's Fenway Park was built in several stages. In fact, Fenway's most recognizable feature, the Green Monster, wasn't erected until the park was more than 20 years old. And in the 30s and 40s, green paint took a back seat to advertisements. There was even a time when Chicago's Wrigley Field didn't have its signature ivy on the walls or its famous outfield bleachers. In 1937, temporary stands could be seen in right field, but full construction of the bleachers didn't begin until midway through the 1938 season. The same year, the ivy was planted. Each of the grand old ballparks was unique in its appearance, but the meaning they had to those who went there was the same. Author, Ray Robinson. The stands looked enormous. The outfielders who were cavorting in the outfield looked to be, you know, miles away from you. And this cavernous cathedral that you went to, you know, is enormous. And you're a little boy, and, and everything looked so large and bigger than life in your mind's eye. I want to go to the ball game. Donald I Hall. Go American men, ball. not all of us, but a great many of us, think back uh, to baseball in connection with our fathers, maybe with our grandfathers, with uncles, with people who played particular games sometimes, but also people with whom we went to particular games, or people we played catch with. There is something historical about baseball. Come on and root for the home team with a hip, 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 hip hooray. Let's sit with the boys and, and we'll make lots of noise at the baseball game. Take me out to the ball game. Take me out with the crowd. Buy me some peanuts and... You walk into the portals and you look 
down beneath you, you see that uh, green grass, as I hope and wish and cherish in my conservative way, the grass field shining in front of you, and you are not just back in time, but you are outside of time. We have something that separates itself out from our duration. For one island there, we are 62 years old, we are 12 years old, we are 40 years old, and the game exists in some island outside of time, some eternal present, which is a kind of uh, corridor into eternity. The one ballpark that stood out in terms of its size and baseball significance was the old Yankee Stadium. Opened in 1923, it was the most dramatic of three ballparks within the boundaries of New York City. Just across the river from Yankee Stadium stood the polo grounds. Robert Creamer. I was, you know, hundreds of miles from home, and I sat in this sort of empty room, maybe 15 guys scattered around listening to the radio. And I just felt so far away from baseball. I really felt lonesome. And a big sergeant came in, big top sergeant. And he had a cigar. He was sitting a few feet away from me. And the cigar smoke floated over to where I was. And I thought of the polo grounds. It just came back to me with a wave, this marvelous feeling that I was at a ballpark all of a sudden because of that stinking cigar. Crazy about a ball game ever since I can recall. Crazy about a ball game ever since I can recall. So you find me in the bleachers when the umpire yells, Mabel! I'm rooting for the home team, rooting for them win or lose. I'm rooting for the home team, rooting for them win or lose. I'm happy when they win one, when they lose, I get those blues. In every town and city, yes, any place you name, there's nothing fills the fans like a baseball game. Crazy about a ball game. The third stadium in New York was Brooklyn's Ebbets Field. Like nearly all of the ballparks of its day, Ebbets Field had some very interesting physical features, largely because it was built within the confines of its surrounding neighborhood. But what was really unique about Ebbets Field was the relationship between the Dodgers, their fans, and their ballpark. Dodger announcer, Red Barber. Ebbets Field was, uh, was typically Brooklyn. Uh, it belonged to Brooklyn. Uh, the, the fans felt it was theirs. Uh, they were close to the players. Uh, they felt the players uh, were not only theirs, they felt they were their children. Uh, they could uh, uh, jeer at them and call them bums, but nobody uh, else had, had better do it. No outsider had better do it, and certainly no, no giant uh, fan had better come into Abbey's Field and, and do it. And the borough of Brooklyn uh, lived and died with that ball club. When the Dodgers lost an afternoon game, there were a lot of cold shoppers. It didn't get eaten. Dodger fans were, for the most part, blue-collar. Still, at the 1952 World Series, it was not unusual to see someone like Humphrey Bogart at Ebbets Field, rooting for the Dodgers along with everyone else, even Lauren Bacall. In New York, picking a team to root for took on special meaning. Robert Creamer. You'd say to somebody, what are you, a Dodger fan, a Giant fan? I mean, it was identification. Are you Catholic, Protestant, Jewish? You're a Giant fan, Dodger fan, Yankee fan? It was a, it was a thing, and that's what you were, and it was part of your life. It was also part of a ball player's life. Infielder Bill Werber. When we were at Boston, we represented the town of Boston, and we loved Boston. When I was playing with Cincinnati, we were winning pennants there. We all, right down to the last man, wanted to win for the people in Cincinnati. And when we won championships and won the World Series, why, we were just delighted that we could do something for those good people. Where's Babe Ruth, the king of SWAT, who rocked the heavens with his blows? Grabowski, Pennock, and Malone. Mother of mercy, where are those? Where's the swagger? Where's the strut? Where's the style that makes the hitter? 
Where's the pitcher's swan-like motion? What in God's name turned life bitter? Is there a heaven with rainbow flags, silver trophies hung on walls, a horseshoe grandstand, mobs of fans, webbed gloves, and official balls? Where's Tony, push him up, Lazari, the quickest man that ever played? Where's the gang that raised the roof in the house that Colonel Rupert made? In 1938, the Chicago Cubs won the National League pennant, and the city responded by saluting its champions in a pre-World Series parade. This film of the parade and of the subsequent World Series is believed to provide the oldest existing color images of a World Series, taken just a few years after 16 millimeter color film was available to the public. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Yes, you said it. This is the first game of the 1938 World Series. This is George Hicks speaking for the National Broadcasting Company at Wrigley Field, Chicago, Illinois. Quite a crowd milling down around the box there near the Yankees dugout where sits Judge Landis this afternoon. You may be interested in some of the home run records of these Yankees. He's just stringing along behind them, and behind them comes the entire squad of the Chicago Cubs. Cubs pitcher, Clay Bryant. I faced good hitters in the National League before we played the Yankees in the World Series. So I wasn't all too much about the Yankees. I know we read about them and, and knew about uh, uh, Dickey, Gehrig, and uh, Gordon, Cressetti, and Ralph, and Selkirk, and DiMaggio, and Hendricks. Uh, but we knew about them. But we figured, and uh, all the pitching staff, and I think the whole ball club figured we could beat them. I saw the lineup, and sure, I uh, I looked at them, and uh, I knew they were good, but uh, I won't say this. After the series is over, they're the greatest club I've seen in baseball. Yeah, well, like uh, Rip Collins says, says, we come, we saw, and we went home after four straight. <laughs> Yankee right fielder Tommy Henrik played on the 38 team, which featured a young Joe DiMaggio, as well as fellow Hall of Famers Lefty Gomez and Bill Dickey, and an aging Lou Gehrig. The 1938 Yankees were the type of team that came out every day to beat you. And that's the way McCarthy wanted his ball players to act. He wanted professionalism out of his ball players. Uh, somebody was saying, uh, McCarthy, you like Joe Gordon, don't you? He says, I sure do. He says, why do you like him? He says, I'll show you why. Hey, Joe, come over here. He says, what's your batting average? Gordon says, I don't know. He says, what's your fielding average? He says, I don't know. Okay, Joe. And he walks away and McCarthy he says, that's what I like. All he does is come to beat you. Okay. Multiply that by nine. That's a tough outfit to beat. My greatest feeling was getting dressed in a Yankee uniform because I knew I was with a bunch of pros. That was my thrill. I said, this is a ball club. From 1936 through 1939, the Yankees won four straight championships. Author, Donald Honig. I think that was the, the team that established what uh, was the Yankees' so-called corporate image. Business-like, of intense uh, sobriety, no nonsense. They were, they were expected to win. They went out there to win. And it, uh, Gehrig, I think, was the first the first one to establish this image, being extremely serious in all business on, on the baseball field. The quality of play that Lou Gehrig brought to the Yankees was matched only by the quality of his person. Gehrig was the magnificent Yankee, and his departure under tragic circumstances in 1939 might have ruined a lesser team. The Yanks, however, never slipped in stature nor standing a great deal of which had to do with the incredible talents of Joe DiMaggio, 
the man who carried the Yankee torch after Gehrig, Donald Honig. This was the ultimate ball player, not only uh, for talent, but for style and grace. I mean, this was the, uh, the epitome of uh, celestial craftsmanship in a ball player. DiMaggio has to this day a mystique. And uh, like most mystiques, it's unexplainable. Is he shy? Is he aloof? Is, uh, is he a snob? Uh, what, what is he? To the fan, it never really mattered, because there was Joe out on the ball field. Author, Robert Creamer. When Barra was a rookie, he hit a pop fly and jogged down to first base. And I think the ball was dropped, and he had to scurry to, to get to where he was going, and DiMaggio gave him that cold look. And apparently when DiMaggio looked at people coldly, they just shriveled. He had a sense of command, an aura of, of being you know, majestic almost. He was the king. DiMaggio's Yankees had many rivals, but perhaps none drove them to excel as much as the Boston Red Sox, a team with five future Hall of Famers in its lineup in the early 1940s. Tommy Henrik. It was something special. It was absolutely something special. For years, for years, Red Sox, Yankees. Oh boy, oh boy. It's the highlight of the year. What made it special was the, the talent on both sides. We knew we had a good ball club. We got DiMaggio on our side. They got Williams. They got Bobby Doerr. We got Joe Gordon. They had Joe Cronin, who could hit with anybody. Jimmy Fox. Gee, you think you're not going to fear those birds? And we, and we went up against them, and they were some tremendous battles. Oh, and, and uh, Bobby Doerr says, uh, why didn't we win? Didn't we have a good ball club? I says, you scared us to death, Bobby. Sure, you had a good ball club. Why didn't we win? I says, I don't know. I think the owner liked you more than our owners liked us. I says, I used to walk through that, your parking lot out there, and I says, most all of the things in there were Cadillacs. <laughs> I says, we had, a, we had a bear down more for ours. After the war, the Red Sox often approached greatness, but never attained their ultimate goal of winning the World Series. They won the pennant in 46, but lost the series to the Cardinals in seven games. In 48, the Indians beat them in a playoff. And in 49, they fell to the rival Yanks on the last day of the season. Poet Donald Hall. There is surely something in the image of the Red Sox in particular that um, has to do with not mere defeat, but glorious defeat, or almost making it, or the whole series of crucial moments. And I think that defeats are talked about more and moments of losing it than any moments of victory. More than any other single player, it was Ted Williams who epitomized the Red Sox persona. He was our Achilles, our reluctant uh, warrior, our sullen genius. Uh, and he could be counted on always to be doer and difficult and superb. Yes, he's indelibly Boston. of my memory of baseball, which is purest and most joyous, is rehearsing in my mind the swing of Ted Williams. He coiled on himself uh, like a barber pole turning around. He had that compact swing that was totally efficient, strong, and that looked loose and graceful, although it was so compact and efficient. It was a wonderful thing to see. I can see it in my head as often as I like. How dear to my heart was the old-fashioned batter who scattered line drives from the spring to the fall. He did not resemble the up-to-date batter who swings from his heels and misses the ball. The up-to-date batter I'm not very strong for. 
He shatters the ozone with all of his might. And that is the reason I hanker and long for those who doubled to left and tripled to right. The old-fashioned batter, the eagle-eyed batter, the thinking man's batter, who tripled to right. The great men of baseball are at the very heart of the game. They are the ones who set the standards, the ones who created the memories. They take us to different heights. They allow us to dream. Before 1947, everyone affiliated with baseball in any capacity, every player, every coach, every manager, every owner, shared at least one common denominator, the color of their skin. Poet Donald Hall. The game that I grew up with was a white game. And it is appalling, of course, to think back and realize that as I was growing up, it was a white game and I didn't notice. I didn't uh, object. I had no notion. When we look back to that injustice, we're looking back to American history, not the parts of it that we're proudest of, but it's part of our social history, part of our cultural history. That uh, terrible split and then the commencement of healing of that wound with Jackie Robinson. Brooklyn Dodger, Don Newcomb. Even though I didn't have a, a Joe DiMaggio or a Ted Williams or Babe Ruth uh, uh, as an idol. Uh, I developed an idol, his name was Jackie Robinson. It was just such a, um, a phenomenal era. We wondered whether or not it would ever happen. And Jackie said, I'm gonna make it happen. He would say that many, many times. I'm gonna make it happen, they're not gonna be able to stop me. I had no idea where my life would go. I had no idea that I'd ever be a part of history. Soon after Robinson, new heroes like Roy Campanella would emerge. Gradually, as the landscape of the game changed, baseball became integrated. Now, it was truly a national pastime. The 50s saw the arrival of many of the game's greatest players, some who would go on to rewrite baseball's record book. Inevitable breaking of the color barrier also allowed for some of the older established stars of the Negro Leagues, like Satchel Paige, to finally pitch in the major leagues. It wasn't something that erased the years of injustice. It only served to remind us of what we missed. America is a country which encourages and welcomes change. Through the years, sometimes on its own, or sometimes with a little push, Baseball was able to accept and incorporate some of those changes into the fabric of the game. Some improved it. Others made us long for the game we used to know. But the important thing to remember is that baseball was just living up to its moniker, 
as the American pastime. Ultimately, when the population began to shift out west, so too did baseball. The Braves moved to Milwaukee. The Dodgers and Giants left New York. That signaled the beginning of new chapters in the history of the game. But sadly, it also meant the end of certain others. Author, Lawrence Ritter. When you're abandoned, I think you're living in a dream world if you continue after the abandonment to glorify the one that, that left you. It's sort of self-defeating, not to mention quite irrational. Uh, my team left. I don't have any romanticism left. I don't have a team anymore. I was a Giant fan. There aren't any New York Giants anymore. There might not be any New York Giants anymore, or St. Louis Browns, or Washington Senators. The days of watching Ted Williams in left are long over, and the wondrous Willie Mays no longer wears his uniform. Time marches on. Transition is inevitable. With each passing day, the game of our youth moves even further into history. But those vivid images that are so much a part of our life will always remain. Game called. Across the field of play, the dusk has come, the hour is late. The fight is done and lost or won. The player files out through the gate. The tumult dies. The cheer is hushed. The stands are bare. The park is still. But through the night, there shines the light of home beyond the silent hill. Game call. Where in the golden light, the bugle rolled the reveille. The shadows creep where night falls deep and taps has called the end of play. The game is done, the score is in, the final cheer and jeer have passed. But in the night beyond the fight, the player finds his rest at last. Game called upon the field of life. The darkness gathers far and wide. The dream is done, the score is spun. That stands forever in the guide. Nor victory, nor yet defeat, is chalked against the player's name. But down the roll, the final scroll shows only how he played the game.